Welcome to our fifth lecture. Our fifth lecture is an update in cardiovascular disease in the ambulatory care setting. Once again, I have no uh, financial or conflicts of interest to share, but what we're going to do with this lecture is a lot of us are already probably well-versed in hypertension, um, heart failure, and coronary artery disease, but I'd like to focus on this is kind of just review, you know, some of the key things the guidelines suggest. Re- visit cl clinical monitor requirements that we as pharmacists should be working with because I think this is another ideal role where we could do collaborative agreement with physician practices. And even if we don't want to endeavor into collaborative practice agreement, this is another area that I believe um, that we can put some services together within our pharmacy, just as something simple as blood pressure taking day. And so, you know, or identifying cardiovascular risk screenings. So these are things that I hope that you take away some pearls um, as you're getting this CE. So as we know, hypertension is the most common condition in primary care. One to three patients have hypertension, according to the National Heart and Lung Institute. And the biggest thing that we worry about is hypertension is the start of everything. Hypertension, as we know, always starts out as that silent disease, but it's the risk factor that can lead to MIs, heart attacks, cardiovascular events, um, acute renal failure, and death. The biggest thing that we know with hypertension, especially it as the get-go, just like in diabetes, is lifestyle modifications. And lifestyle modifications is a big place where we look at things, such as reducing our salt intake. And actually, this is actually should be a little bit more stringent. This comes from the European uh, guideline, but I just want to compare. I'm going to compare and contrast the European one and the American ecology is, but we should be restricting our salt intake. And some of the guidelines say actually restricting it below three or 2.8. I suggest just below three is my own personal opinion. I think that is adequate enough to get somebody started because one of the problems when you do doing the restriction in salt intake is that um, you start losing a little bit of flavor and taste and then people start craving salt. So it's almost you got to wean yourself down off it. There's some great apps out there that can track salt intake and you just think about it. You got one Big Mac, you know, and as you're sipping on your margarita, uh, down there, um, in you know, at at the resort with the salt around there. Just think about your salt intake. So, but have fun. Uh, vacations are meant to be bad. Um, we also uh, recommend it in the lifestyle modifications of hypertension is moderate alcohol intake, um, and that is anywhere from average of two drinks per day. Um, there's a big push it has been for the last twenty years of the dash diet, where we're doing more vegetables, fruit, low-fat dairy intake, less red meats. Um, keeping our BMI goal uh, below 25, which can be um, you know, a struggling thing. Um, and then some evidence showing our waist circumference. If we can keep our waist circumference below 40 inches in men, 34 in women, it decreases our risks. Exercise goal, getting at least 150 minutes per week, um, greater than 30 minutes a day. And then the final one is quit smoking. However, we're always fed up talking about what is our target weight. I think the one thing in when talking to your patients, and you probably have done this, is in lifestyle modifications, we start slow. First thing with salt, take the salt shaker off the table, all right? Um, think about adding other spices to maybe your foods. Um, limit it, our fast food intake. Limit it, our canned food uh, intake. Things that contain high salt. Um, trying to use the plate method, like I described in the diabetes lecture, of having more, you know, vegetables and, and salads and, and fruits and smaller portions. And the portions of your meat and your uh, carbs should be, if you make the size of your fist, that is what your portion size should be for each meal. So, every several couple of years, the JNC updates their guidelines. The JNC 8 was actually uh, a long time frame before uh, we saw its update guidelines. And they were, you know, the other problem we had was they didn't know where they were going to publish them. But they, they were published. Um, I remember learning, when I learned hypertension, it was off the JNC 5 guidelines. So they don't come out every year um, compared to others. 
one of the big controversies that comes out of this guideline is actually what is our goal of blood pressure. And so what what we did see out of these last guidelines is a change. And if you look across all the different guidelines, they don't vary significantly, um, drastically, I guess you would say, but there is a little bit. And so, for example, if you take into some of the guidelines is basically, you know, we want to keep our blood pressure uh, below 140 over 90 in patients less than 60 years of age. We, you know, we start thinking about treating if they're above that. And if they're above 60 years of age, we want to keep it below 150. There's some arguments of should it be just at 60? Because, you know, in my opinion, between 60 and 70 really is not uh, considered clinically geriatric. Um, but there is enough evidence that when we do get into our 80s that probably a blood pressure below 140 over 90 is suffice. Um JNC-8, as it has in prior years, has not recommended beta blockers as first-line therapy. Some of the other guidelines, the European has said it's okay. But the reason why beta blockers, and they originally were like after hydrochlorothiazide, were always part of the first-line therapy, was think about this. You're starting to try to encourage somebody for exercise. Well, if you put them on a beta blocker initially, unless they have other compelling reasons, well, they're just going to get tired. And so beta blockers should be reserved as second line, you know, or third, probably more down the third line, third line, unless they have other comorbid conditions such as heart failure, you know, AFib. And then we think about initiating two drug therapy if the person's significantly above um, 160 over 100 in the JNC8 guidelines and, and the both American Heart Association um, and American Association for Hypertension also agree with that. Um, the other thing too is um, we don't just diagnose somebody with high blood pressure at one reading. If you think about reviewing your blood pressure techniques, everybody knows how to use the cuff, you know, pump it up. But you ask the simple questions when you do tell them to sit down. Have they had any caffeine, smoked a cigarette in the last half hour, which could significantly elevate that. Um, white coat syndrome is obviously, you know, truly significant, um, can occur. Sometimes people are better off doing like a home 24-hour monitoring of their blood pressure. Um, but like I said, it should not be diagnosed in just one sitting. Um, obviously, our goal blood pressures, like I said, they're all over the board, but most of them agree at least below 140 over 90. Um, and if they, some suggest if you have significant um, kidney disease and diabetes, we may want to be a little bit over that. Another big change that came out of these guidelines is that less than uh, 140 over 90 is suffice for diabetes patients and chronic kidney disease patients. It used to be 130 over 80. Obviously, if somebody can tolerate the lower, the better, um, especially in younger patients. As I said, elderly patients, we really don't like to push. There's some evidence that if we go too low blood pressure, it may affect organ um, perfusion of blood. So a couple things in the JNC-8. What is the initial drug of choice for non-African Americans, including diabetes patients, thiazide diuretics? Now, I did talk about in the last lecture that thiazides may um, increase glucose a little bit. However, the, it's not significant enough that the benefits of thiazide diuretic far outweigh uh, the risks. Other initial could be calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, or angiotensin II blockers. In African Americans, including di di diabetes patients, um, because they don't seem to respond to ACEs and ARBs as significantly uh, compared to non-African Americans, to recommend using thiazides, diuretic, thiazide diuretic, or a calcium channel blocker. And when we really talk about calcium channel blockers, we're really talking about the non uh I mean the dihydroperidines, such as amlodipine, philodipine, for your choice. For patients with chronic kidney disease and hypertension, regardless of race or diabetes, um, we may think about initially adding therapy, um, should include an ACE or ARB to improve kidney outcome. Now, one of the things we'll talk about, the monitoring of ACEs and ARBs, and there is a rare case they can actually worsen kidney function, but that's really only in renal artery stenosis. But in all other chronic kidney disease, um, ACEs and ARBs are recommended. We just may have to start low with them due to some of its side effect profile. Um, with African Americans, with or without proteinuria, it still says that the benefits of the ACE and ARB, the only thing that you may have to do with an ACE and ARB 
um, in, in this ethnicity is that you may have to increase the dose uh, more quickly than you would in a non. <clears throat> and, you know, there's no evidence um, for um, using these blockers in greater than 75 years of age. And the reason why is because in these patients, they're more at risk for hyperkalemia, high potassium issues, and diuretic is an option for initial therapy. So once we put somebody on the therapy, we should reassess and treat them uh, monthly. Uh, uh, avoid ACEs and ARBs in combination. Initially, when they came out, thought there might be benefit with them, especially like in heart failure. But when you put an ACE and ARB together, it increases the risk for high hyperkalemia, high potassium by 20%. Consider a two-drug initial therapy for stage two um, hypertension and goal blood pressure not reached with three drugs use drugs from other classes. Here's just a good algorithm looking at the DARIF in various states and what we do. The other key thing is once we put somebody on it, we need to you know, counsel them about obviously like dizziness initially, you know, be careful going for sitting for standing, talking about lifestyle modifications, also to reevaluate them every two to three weeks. If they have other comorbid conditions, we talked about diabetes, chronic kidney disease, ACEs or ARBs might be a good option. In chronic kidney disease, if they can't use an ACE and ARB, um, non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like diltiazem or verapamil can work. And in heart failure, um, we'll talk about the drugs there, but some of the cornerstones are ACE, ARBs, and beta blockers. So let's look at heart failure. Here's a picture of a normal heart, pumps blood smoothly, it's synchronized perfectly. But what happens with long years of, especially with uncontrolled hypertension, all right? That lower left ventricle is you know, starting to become enlarged, starting to um, walls thicken. And because of that, it loses its elasticity. It's like a worn out rubber band. It doesn't have the ability to stretch and snap back that it does because of that it reduces its ability to pump blood we have two types of heart failure with systolic the squeezing heart failure which is the most common kind decreased pump function of the heart which results in fluid backup of the lungs and our classic heart failure symptoms we also can have diastolic heart failure which involves a thickened stiff heart muscle as a result the heart does not feel properly and this results in fluid backup in the lungs and heart failure symptoms what are the risk factors for heart failure? We already talked about hypertension, but coronary artery disease, valvular heart disease, uncontrollable diabetes, um, other um, obesity, age, smoking. Notice smoking. Smoking cesation is another program, a clinical program a pharmacy could benefit from because it ties into so many different disease states. A key indicator for diagnosing heart failure is, um, is the ejection fraction that the clinician would measure. And the injection fraction is the percentage of blood that's pumped out of our heart during each beat. Normal heart should be about 50 to 70 percent. Anything less than 40 percent is considered heart failure, and we start getting below 40 percent is when we start seeing symptoms of heart failure. The biggest thing, too, is remember in heart failure, what is the body trying to do? The body is tr sometimes trying to protect us, and so if it sees as low ejection fraction, this poor cardiac output, what does the body do? Huh, maybe we need to make the heart work harder. And so what it'll do? It'll use beta stimulation to stimulate the heart to work faster. But what happens is as the heart works faster, it eventually wears out because it's just not strong enough and can also worsen heart failure. Hence, that is why beta blockers are one of the cornerstone therapies. The other thing the body does is it sees that it has low volume, maybe. That is the cause, because we have low cardiac output, we have low volume throughout the system. So it thinks that maybe we need to hold on to water and fluid. So it fires up the renin angiotensin system. And that is where the ACE inhibitors can help or ARBs can benefit by preventing that system from continuing. There's different classifications of heart failure. Um, there's the American uh, Cardiology, um, College of Cardiology, and the New York Heart Classification Symptom. The difference of them is the New York Heart is more symptomatic, whereas uh, the ACC is more on 
you know, structural changes and focuses on when to end therapy. So what is the drug therapy in heart failure? Well, the two cornerstone drugs that we think about that can alter and slow down the progression of heart failure and affect mortality are either ACEs or ARBs or beta blockers. And remember I said earlier, we do not want to use ACEs and ARBs in combination. Um, the other thing with the ACEs and ARBs, we want to maximize them to the highest dose possible to shut down the renin system without having side effects. And the other thing, beta blockers, we want to try to maximize that and beta block them to, to, the, to a patient can tolerate that, hoping for a target heart rate somewhere between the 60s and low 70s. Anything below 60, we may want to back off because the person's going to be feel sluggish and um, you just feel tired. The Joxin, although it doesn't um, affect um, mortality, we talked about the Joxin in our geriatric talk, the Joxin actually can help maybe improve quality. It doesn't um, improve quality of life. It doesn't affect mortality, but by giving that positive inotropic effect, um, it seems to help improve heart's pumping function. Diuretics is the one that, although we classically think about with heart failure, and a lot of times we go ahead with, with loop diuretics for two reasons. Loop diuretics are a little bit more potent to pull off fluid, but also loop diuretics um, also can work in people with chronic kidney disease. Thiazides are not not as effective when we get to 30 mLs per minute. And then the other drug that we may add at the end there is aldosterone blockade and spironolactone. Um, is our classic one. And spironolactone obviously acts as a diuretic, but it's also working in blocking aldosterone. So why does the doctor have the patient take so many pills, they may ask you. Well, the diuretics and the DIG are to help improve symptoms. The biggest thing, though, we want to stress when we stress adherence with the beta blockers, the ACEs, or the ARBs, or the aldosterone blockers, these are the things that are going to help improve your heart and improve survival. The guidelines get updated every couple of years. Um, for this talk, we're going to focus more on outpatient guidelines. The 2016 guidelines focused a little bit on new management happening at the acute level. So evidence-based pharmacotherapy, the goal is to reduce morbidity and mortality in systolic heart failure patients, uh, which is the most common kind. And obviously, these patients usually have an ejection fraction of 40%. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction has been called diastolic. These patients have an ejection fraction of 50% or higher, and we don't really have a defined pharmacotherapy for these patients. Biggest other thing is to uh, be cautious with diuresis. We don't want to uh, dehydrate or cause electrolyte imbalances. Uh, think about underlying causes of exacerbating conditions, such as salt intake diet, um, adherence to medications, and treating other comorbid conditions. We want to ensure patients with systolic heart failure on a minimum of an ACE or ARB or a beta blocker because they have the best and the beta blockers with the best efficacy in heart failure are either pisoprolol, metoprolol succinate, not the tartrate, or carvedilol. And we also want to get them at evidence-based doses. For example, lisinopril is 20 milligrams, metoprolol succinate is 200, and spironolactone 25. Now, I realize we can't always get them to those, um, but you want to take a look at your package inserts, your any of your uh, facts and comparison. They will give you the recommended doses for these disease states. Spironolactone is one of the only ones we don't want to push it. There's no evidence going above 25 milligrams we get more bang for a buck with it. In fact, we have greater side effect risks such as hyperkalemia. Other medications to, to consider, obviously we use diuretics for fluid retention. Uh, newer drug, Entresto, which um, consists of sacabiotril, and I'm gonna go into more detail of this a little bit later, and Valsartan is reserved for class three or class four heart failure. And this is to be used for people that have been on ACE and ARBs but still have persistent symptoms and repeated exasperation and hospitalizations and also may have a systolic blood pressure of greater than 100 millimeters of mercury or higher. An aldosterone antagonist like spironolactone um, should be reserved for people that have heart failure less than 35% or post-MI or patients with below 40% with symptoms or diabetes.
We Once again, we need to monitor their potassium and their renal function. Um, it doesn't seem to be effective in patients with a creatinine clearance less than 30 mLs a minute. Other medications to consider in African Americans because they don't always respond as well to ACEs and ARBs, even though I talked about earlier we do use them in chronic kidney disease. Another option possibly is hydrolyzine, anisosorbide dinitrate. DIG, there's no additional benefit going to especially the 0.25 dose, and we want to maintain target levels between 0.5 to 0.9. Lifestyle changes in heart failure. Obviously, once again, low sodium diet, losing weight, trying to be as physical active as not always possible in heart failure patients, uh, reducing alcohol or caffeine intake, and smoking sensation is there again. So in summary, heart failure is common and has a high mortality. Drug therapy does improve survival, especially with basal blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and aldosterone antagonists. Newer device therapies are showing problems, such as biventricular pacemakers. Um, transplants seem rare, but technology for mechanical assist devices continue to improve. So who knows what the future lies for us. Coronary artery disease. When we're at counseling our patient, they may ask you, what is a heart attack, otherwise known as an MI? It happens when one or more of the coronary arteries that supply the heart becomes blocked. Coronary arteries supply the heart with blood, oxygen, and nutrients that keep it healthy and functioning. And when that artery is blocked, that area of the heart, its supplies become damaged and the tissue may become dead. Usually caused by coronary artery disease. What happens to coronary artery disease? We see fatty deposit plaques form in the walls of these arteries. Fatty deposits are more likely to form if you have high cholesterol. These plaques can break open and cause blood clots to form. Blood clots can block off the coronary arteries, preventing blood flow to the heart and cause a heart attack. Here's a you know cartoon representation of showing the plaques and um, the clot forms. Um, what can happen is it can cause damage to the interpart vessel, and the blood clot you know forms. It blocks a flow to the heart, and hence the heart attack. The clinical bottom line is that clinicians should be diagnosing you know, people that have predictors for coronary artery disease, such as age, as we get older, um, men at around in their mid-40s, women in their mid-50s, uh, men are more prone, um, not, you know, when we get into our 40s, not ruling out an evaluation of heartburn, smoking history, high cholesterol, and type 2 diabetes. Physical exams um, identify cardiac disease, and obviously there's diagnostic testing, coronary uh, um, angiograms to evaluate whether or not there is blockage, and sometimes surgical invasive therapies such as stent placing may be required. What are the goals of treatment? Obviously to minimize likelihood of death and maximize health and function. Strategies for achieving these goals, patient education, lifestyle modifications, obviously medical therapy, sometimes revascularization, surgical therapy, and you know those guidelines were reserved to the clinicians. What can we do? We can help you know identify patients who have these risk factors, educating about risk factors they can modify, improving medication adherence, and helping them improve their patient satisfaction. So we should you know we can also do our own cardiovascular screening clinics in the pharmacy. Um, we can talk to them about ways to reduce factors such as weight loss and spoken sensation, counseling them about the benefits of their medications, and address limitations about physical activity, and letting them know when they need to call the doctor if they're having chest pain that has not gone away after 15 minutes. Also, too, they may want to talk to their doctors about what to do in signs of a heart attack. A lot of times, initially, is you know taking sublingual nitroglycerin, biting down and chewing on an aspirin. And when do they go to the emergency room? So what are the medical therapies that can prevent an MI? Antiplatelet therapy. Most people with coronary artery disease are going to be on aspirin daily therapy. Most guidelines recommend no more than 81 milligrams per day. These patients also should get a, a flu vaccination per year. Um, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, and beta blockers have all shown to prevent MIs, specifically second MIs. And so using these agents um, can help with that. Beta blockers can also help decrease the workload of the heart, so therefore it'll help decrease angina, chest pain-like symptoms. Vitamin and mineral supplements aren't really recommended for preventing coronary artery disease. 
smoking sensation, physical activity, we talked about these before, and dietary modification. Some recommendations of having more omega-3 fatty acids, fish in our diets, um, um, may also help contribute in preventing or slowing the progression of coronary artery disease. And another cornerstone is lipid management. What medical therapies relieve symptoms? Short-acting nitrates. We all know how to counsel somebody on sublingual nitroglycerin, keeping it in its vowel. Um, if they use it, placing it under their tongue. If there's no relief in five minutes, repeat. And usually the max is uh, three doses in 15 minutes, then call 911. Um, for chronic therapy, beta blockers are one of the cornerstones to help decrease the workload of heart, prevent pain. Calcium channel blockers can also and long-acting nitrate therapies such as isosorbide mononitrate, nitroglycerin patches. The key thing, though, with the long-acting nitrates, whichever one they are, you want to make sure there is a 12-hour nitroglycerin-free interval to prevent tolerance. So we all know that with the patches, we recommend to take them off at bedtime. Imdor isosorbide mononitrate is a true 12-hour release drug. It should only be dosed once a day. So if you get a prescription for Imdor 30 milligrams twice a day, they should be really changing that script to 60 milligrams twice a day, once a day. If it's the dinitrates, um, if it's the dinitrates, I would, um, you want to space the timing of that because it's sometimes multiple times a day to like an 8, 4, and 6 within a 12-hour window. And Renexa, uh, ranalazine is used for people that have been resistant on the prior therapies. You know, alternative surgical therapies is revascularization, spinal cord stimulation that can also help. The other key cornerstone for coronary artery disease is to have cholesterol under control. We know cholesterol is a substance that's found in our body. Everyone uh, needs it to help build cell walls, but there's good cholesterol and they're bad types of cholesterol. So LDL is the one that increases it. HDLs are good. That helps take away bad cholesterol. And triglycerides are not necessarily cholesterol, but they can accumulate if it's too high. And we definitely worry about treating triglycerides, which we usually use uh, phenofibrate type of derivatives, especially if they become above 400. When is too much cholesterol in your blood? If it builds up on the walls and arteries, things can, obviously I talked about earlier, can cause plaques and we can get hardening of the arteries and then a heart attack can occur. So the biggest thing that um, the newer guidelines emphasize on statins is that the statins really are the only choice um, for first line therapy. Um, other options, if you had to, could be Zetia and then the newer uh, uh, injectable um, LDL inhibitor drugs, which are very costly. Um, but, you know, the biggest thing is people that we should identify, people that may have a history of coronary artery disease, MIs, or coronary artery events, they definitely should be getting what's considered high-intensity statin therapy. And high-intensity statin therapy are doses between a torvastatin 40 to 80 milligrams or ruvastatin 20 to 40 milligrams. The biggest thing we know that with our patients is, a, you know, we hear about the myopathies. Um, obviously, you could slow, start them out low, slowly titrate them up. If you're thinking about, although the evidence isn't super strong, but herbal therapy, one of the theories behind myopathies is that maybe um, that um, it's a, due to a decrease in coenzyme Q10. And so what I recommend there is that they could do a supplement of coenzyme Q10 along with that. Um, for those who are complaining of myopathy, that sometimes rufostatin uh, because it's metabolized different, um, goes through more through 2C9 than 3A4, less interference with other drug interactions, and therefore people may tolerate it more. Um, another drug that's similar to that is pravastatin. Uh, the only downside of pravastatin is not that potent um, for that. And so this is just a listing of those therapies, and the biggest reason why is those high-risk patients, coronary artery disease patients, we want to lower their LDL by greater than 50%. Counseling these patients um, about the benefits of this versus you know the the risks and also too that rhabdomyolysis is very rare and the only way that a clinician can diagnose if it's rhabdomyolysis where we have muscle wasting is they will order what's called a CPK crassophosphokinase enzyme test and that actually has to be about ten to fifteen times above the normal 
to roll into rhabdomyolysis. Key thing that we can do in our pharmacies is obviously you can get on any website, a cardiovascular risk calculator, do a blood pressure screening that day and maybe identify what are those risk factors. Ages when we get above 40, male race, um, uh, African Americans are a greater risk for cardiovascular disease. History of hypertension, diabetes, tobacco, and measurements such as cholesterol, HDL, systolic blood pressure. It's a good wellness type of clinic to do. And a lot of these calculators, what they'll do is they'll give the estimated um, 10 year risk for the development of coronary artery disease. And this is a great place to start talking about the different therapies such as statin therapy. And you want to put them at things that they could possibly modify, such as their blood pressure, their cholesterol, their lifestyle factors. So numerous pathways that could lead to helping your patients. So let's look at some of the medications and their cl clinical monitoring requirements for cardiovascular. Thiazide diuretics we talked about earlier are used for monotherapy for hypertension. Um, are effective up to a creatinine clearance of 30 mLs per minute. Um, they're very good in elderly patients for isolated systolic hypertension. In fact, they're the drug of choice. The other option for isolated systolic hypertension is calcium channel blockers like amlodipine. Um, and then the other pro is that it prevents um, uh, calcium from leaving the body, so it actually may help slow demineralization and osteoporosis. Side effects of it is that it could uh, prevent the elimination of uric acid. Those thiazides um, could uh, exacerbate or um, cause gout to be worse in patients with gout. There is that chance of blood sugar raising, but like I said, the benefits of the drug far outweigh the risk. It may increase your lipid panel a little bit, but the benefits still all far away the risk. Key things we worry about is potassium loss. However, if we keep the dose no greater than 25 milligrams, less likely for hypokalemia. In fact, most evidence since JNC5 has shown that we really don't get any more bang for our buck from going from 25 to 50 milligrams. The other thing we have to worry about is people that may have a sulfonamide hypersensitivity. And obviously in counseling, another thing we tell patients, especially in the summertime, is there's photosensitivity. Loop diuretics are more potent. We usually redu uh, reserve those for congestive heart failure or patients with renal dysfunction that they have a creatinine clearance less than 30. They also can exacerbate uric acid. Um, if we get too toxic with them, they've been known to affect um, ototoxicity, um, hearing loss, and also we have to worry about sulfonamide hypersensitivity um, reactions. Beta blockers, we know that um, they are good in helping reduce um, sympathetic uh, uh, stimulation to the heart, um, that they also help in congestive heart failure, they help in angina, they help in different rate things. Precautions in using the non-selectives because they can affect diseases such as COPD, asthma, and chronic bronchitis. We also worry about um, things such as um, peripheral artery disease that, you know, people that have significantly bad peripheral artery disease. And then the other thing is I talked about in the diabetes talk is that it can also, too, uh, mask hypoglycemic symptoms. We have to worry about beta blockers um, that you know, the biggest side effect of selective is too low of a heart rate. And what's too low? A lot of conditions clinicians consider below 60 is too low of a heart rate where we start feeling sluggish and not feeling you know active. The other thing is if we have to take patients off these drugs, we need to do a slow taper. Um, one of the recommendations may be reduced by 50% of the dose for three days, then reduce another 50% in another three days due to we can get rebound hypertension from an abrupt withdrawal, which can cause angina exacerbations in, in ischemic heart patients, which actually could lead to heart attack. ACE inhibitors, here are some of our common ones, enalapril, catapril, lisinopril. Obviously, it inhibits the enzyme that converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. The PRO, it's great for CHF because it's shutting down the renin system. Evidence has shown because its effects on the heart, it decreases the risk for uh, MI and also a secondary heart. It also seems to help slow down the progression of 
left ventricular hypertrophy, which is associated with CHF. In fact, we may see improvement of patients with this on its renal protective in patients with diabetes. Downside ADRs, we have to be cautioned in patients with renal insufficiency uh, because um, uh, that, you know, we worry about hyperkalemia, but we can use it. And also, we just like all of these drugs, we're going to tell people to be careful from going from sitting to standing. What we worry about, too, in renal insufficiency, when somebody's first on this drug, what we do is we get a baseline serum creatinine, which we use to help monitor renal function. If we see that increase by 30% from baseline within two to three weeks, we should stop the drug. And then one actually, the if it's a PCP, they should refer them to a nephrologist, which will check out for a condition known as renal artery stenosis. Angiotensin uh, two blockers work very similar, but they're blocking angiotensin two right at the receptor level. Um, those con- considered with Losartan, Velsartan, Candesartan. Um, they also um, help in patients with heart failure and in kidney disease. They also follow that same role of checking the serum creatinine. We should be checking the potassium um, too. A little note about Losartan. Losartan has some uresuric um, clearance um, properties. And Losartan, if I had somebody with gout, Losartan is probably the arm of choice that it helps in combination. Velsartan is the arm that has been most studied in congestive heart failure patients. Calcium channel blockers, calcium channel blockers work by blocking the voltage-sensitive calcium channels, thereby causing vasodilation. We have two different types. We have the dihydroperidines like amlodipine, philodipine, and the non-dihydroperidines such as diltiazem and verapamil. In the non-dihydroperidines, they're more likely to affect heart rate at the AV node. And so we see diltiazem and verapamil being used for different types of rhythmias. In fact, verapamil as an IV in the hospital is used for ventricular tachycardia. Uh, um, they also work on the coronary arteries, so they help decrease oxygen demand, and so that's how they can help with angina. Um, but the one thing is the non is because they slow the heart at the AV node, we should avoid them in conditions such as heart failure. If we had to use a calcium channel blocker in heart failure, we should be using things such as amlodipine for that. The non dihydroperidines I already uh, mentioned, but there are classic side effects because they do affect rate in the heart is bradycardia, first degree heart block, and verapamil is very constipating. Um, dihydroperidines, um, because they're potent vasodilators, the classic symptom, which is dose related, the higher the dose, the more is ankle edema. Hence, the one way to resolve the ankle edema, and this is why you see combinations of products like Lotrel, which is benzopril and amlodipine is combined with an ACE inhibitor or diuretic. Um, drug interactions, verapamiltizem, can inhibit, um, interact with 3A4 drugs and may increase their toxicity, such as carbamazepine, simvastatin, and they also, in combination, verapamiltizem may decrease heart rate when combined with a, heart, with a beta blocker, so use caution. The newer drug, which is known as Entresto, which is Sacabutyl Valsartan, is the first fixed dose combination of a uh, neprilysine inhibitor and an ARB. And the, what this does is it helps reduce the risk of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization in patients. Key thing to note with this one is that this is usually has got to be started in the hospital because you do not start this drug without stopping the ACE inhibitor. And the ACE inhibitor has to be stopped for 36 hours before starting treatment. Side effects is hypotension, hyperkalemia, um, and that is the, one of the biggest issues um, with the reason for stopping. So let's talk about the, the last part here about the pharmacist's role as the healthcare team. Just mention um, a little bit about the literature successes and review case study examples. There are numerous randomized controlled trials over the years since the late 90s that have shown pharmacists, and a lot of these trials are in heart failure clinics, that pharmacists can play a big role in affecting the outcome of the patient. And as we enter into hospitals worrying about readmission of patients, especially heart failure patients, considering collaboration with a primary care physician or 
a cardiologist specialist to help out with heart failure, it sounds like a win-win for pharmacists. And so there is numerous um, information out there on the web on how you could start a heart failure clinic, how you could think about opportunities using this for transitional care for people coming out of the hospital. And so this is a big place that evidence has shown that we have a significant impact on clinical outcomes. So what would you do as the pharmacist? Obviously, patient education, drug um, interaction screening, drug therapy monitoring. Um, There is in the genetic realm starting to look at maybe certain drugs respond better than others. Um, thinking about our African American ethnicity of maybe they would run better to hydrolazine and a, and a nitrate versus an ACE or ARB in congestive heart failure, helping develop guidelines and policies, helping um, prevent medication safety. Think about, especially in heart failure, all the issues that go along with potassium and all these drugs effects on it, and also causing fluid loss. And so pharmacists play a big role. Another place, if you're just looking to get started to doing simple things that can have a great impact, such as cardiovascular risk um, reduction screenings, blood pressure screenings, the Million Hearts campaign has great tools for professionals, great advertising things, and I, I encourage you to check that out if you're looking to start a clinic in your pharmacy. So let's look at a couple cardiac cases. So we have Mrs. H. She's a 79-year-old woman, was admitted to the hospital two weeks ago for an exacerbation of heart failure. She is reported increasing shortness of breath and a marked decrease in activity level. Her injection fraction on, on admission was about 25%. She's here today for a follow-up scheduled visit and has been several weeks after hospitalization. She was started in the hospital on Cathapro and Carvedilol. The patient reports to feeling okay with no orthopenia and no edema. She has noticed a dry cough that can occur at any time during the day or night. Patient also reports she has no appetite she is, she is, since she's been at home and reports to feeling confused at times. She has lost five pounds since discharge. Patient also reports a few dizzy spells several times during the day, but no falls. Examination shows the following. She has a blood pressure of 98 over 60, a pulse of 80, reveals clear lungs. Her potassium is slightly ele- is, is actually elevated, and she does have some moderate renal impairment. Key thing here is that when we talk about older patients, sometimes it's hard to push the doses in them because of the toleration of um, blood pressure. So if we take a look, um, she has a potassium that it's high. Um, her blood pressure is a little bit low, but her heart rate is high. Her current medications are digoxin 0.25, cathepril 25 TID, carvedilol 3.125, and furosemide 40 twice a day. So what will we, we consider some things? One, we would look at, you know what? She's on the dig, but it's a little bit too high for her age and it could be causing problems and she has poor renal function. We should recommend to put that to 0.125. She's complaining about a dry cough, so we'd want to evaluate that's not an exacerbation of her symptoms, but could it be related to the ACE inhibitor? So what could we do? We could possibly switch her over to an ARB like Losartan, um, and then also to maybe we would start at a lower dose and evaluate that. You also, too, remember DIG causes diuresis, and so we might be able to lower that. The other thing with the captopril, um, because notice she has high... Uh, potassium. Maybe we just hold the ACE and ARB all together and see how she stabilizes the potassium and then eventually slowly reintroduce it um, afterwards. Okay? So then the other one is counseling her about things of importance such as taking her medications every day. The next case. We have an 80-year-old man presents to the clinic office following the finding of elevated blood pressure. At his prior visit two weeks ago, when it was discovered, he had a blood pressure of 180 over 76 and a heart rate of 74 while sitting. After three minutes, standing blood pressure. After three minutes, his standing blood pressure was 172 and a heart rate of 80. And what were they testing here? Well, what they were testing was: Does he have orthostatic hypotension? And the definition of orthostatic hypotension is when your systolic pressure drops 20 
millimeters of mercury. And in this case, it dropped, but it didn't drop 20 millimeters. So he doesn't have orthostatic hypotension. At today's visit, his blood pressure is unchanged from the previous visit. His bowel and gait was normal. Um, he does report occasional dizzy spells and has led him to fall at times. There is evidence of stage 3 kidney disease, so he has a creatinine clearance around 30 mL a minute, but no signs of left ventricular hypertrophy, so he has no heart failure. You asked Mr. H to measure his blood pressure at home. He brings his blood pressure records in. They're still high. So this gentleman actually has isolated systolic hypertension, all right? He suffers from severe arthritis of the knee, and he's self-treated with a leave. Um, he's a non-smoker, but he is, does drink. So a couple of things, we could talk to him about lifestyle modifications. We could talk about reducing his alcohol intake. We could talk about exercise. We could talk about his salt intake. But the other thing is if you take a look, um, currently he takes his finasteride. So he has BPH issues. He's taking OTC leave. Obviously we could counsel him about the risks for GI because he is an elderly patient. Um, and he takes Tylenol PM, which that could also worsen his BPH. He's on diphenhydramine. But what would we do about his blood pressure? Well, what we would do about his blood pressure is possibly not maybe add hydrochlorothiazide, which is the drug of choice for isolated stalk hypertension because he has a creatinine clearance of less around 30 mLs a minute, and it's not going to be as effective. Adding a loop diuretic might be overkill right now, so we probably might think about maybe adding a calcium channel blocker like amlodipine or philodipine. The other one too, just to be all inclusive in this case, he also complains of insomnia and he's taking his fluoxetine at bedtime, which can cause stimulation. So obviously for this person from a cardiac standpoint, we're going to counsel him on lifestyle modifications and consider adding to his regimen um, a calcium channel blocker and not the thiazide due to the poor renal function. Here are some assessment questions, once again, that you can review on your own on the handout, and um, Greg will review those during the live session. Thank you, and have a good day.